Thank you, Ivana. Um, I expect that I'm now well connected to you and that you can hear me. So I will just go ahead. If anyone feels to interrupt me and tell me that I'm speaking to myself, please do so. Uh, let me start by apologizing that I can only uh, zoom in for those of you who managed to come to the faculty. I was very much planning to be there, but um, despite the fact that we have a lockdown light, of course, only in the Netherlands this time around, I seem to be disproportionately often targeted by ill teachers and skin children at home. So I had to stay here and do part of the, um, yeah, and had to look after my children in the morning in any event. But uh, now I'm glad that I can in any event zoom in uninterruptedly. And um, I would like to start as the director of ASEC, the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance, to put this conference a bit into context of ASEC history, if you like, and leave the more substantive words to Ivana. It will be really brief. I just want to highlight that this is our 10th annual conference. So we have been holding annual conferences since 2011 with a short interruption because of COVID, because we had to get used to the new situation. Uh, even though, of course, today and tomorrow, we will also experiencing the hybridity that is now uh, part of our lives. We have now adapted to it. And in these annual conferences, what we have done is uh, increasingly so highlighted pressing overarching questions rather than fo focusing on specific policy fields. And I think this is a big success and also a contribution of a center that spans across many different policy fields and puts itself the challenge to address also the underlying fundamental horizontal questions that come up in these different policy fields. So um, in recent years, we have focused on issues such as expertise, technological challenges, and we have identified existing narratives and sketched new overarching visions. And I think in this light, uh, today's and tomorrow's focus on social justice actually fits extremely well. And I'm delighted that uh, Ivana, Ivana Izailovic, who joined us already a year ago, it's just that uh, in COVID times we see each other less often, um, has put this conference together and allows us to have an exchange on migration, discrimination, economic governance in light of these overarching questions. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And I also would like to highlight that I think a particular new aspect of these annual conferences are the, let's say, let's call them special effects of having the emerging scholars workshop today and having also a panel specifically focused on teaching, which I think, A, suits the topic very well. I think we can learn a lot from it. We can also link it to our ongoing project that we are um, running together with the, the Amsterdam Center for International Law and the Amsterdam Center for um, Transformative Law, Transformative Private Law, I believe, um, which is sustainable global economic law. So the idea of um, bringing together the climate crisis and social justice. So here, I think our conference this year also fits very well with that new ambition to yeah, follow up that um, project together with the other institutes at the faculty. And I think we have an amazing program and I'm hoping that many of you also from, um, from Zoom, from home, are able to stay for the entire program and enjoy the discussion. I personally am looking very much forward both to today and tomorrow. And um, yeah, I give the words to Ivana to uh, point us at the substantive choices maybe in the program to an extent. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone uh, who is attending in person, those who are online. Thank you so much for joining us. So my name is Ivana Iselovic. I'm assistant professor uh, at ASILC, where I work on gender, political economy, and law. And um, uh, is that at first they want to join Professor Eckes in thanking you all for being here, uh, contributing to this to this two day event, social uh, justice and, and EU law. And I, uh, before giving the floor to Professor Annette Sherwin, uh, who's Professor of EU Citizenship Law uh, at UVA, and to our fabulous speakers, both people who, who came uh, and who are uh, online, I just wanted to um, 
So a couple of words, give you a little bit of a background on why we decided to put uh, together these series of uh, the series of conversations. And so the main impulse for for organizing this uh, this event was that we felt that it is impossible to think uh, about EU law and governance. Um, which is at the heart of the ASELF, ASELF project without addressing head on uh, the many challenges that the EU and the world are facing and actually have been facing for several decades now, for a long time. Um, whether it is the persistence of gender inequalities and social exclusion, uh, or the fact that even though combating uh, racism, racial inequalities is one of the top priority. We are very far from understanding in law how colonialism and race have shaped uh, EU legal institutions and how uh, EU law continues to impact racial inequalities. Uh, Christine, of course, mentioned the climate uh, emergency that is uh, shaping so many legal reforms, affecting so many legal reforms and EU law. Uh, and finally, the we are witnessing almost on a daily basis the attacks on the rule of law and human rights across Europe, the European Union, uh, whether it is the threat to the independence of the judiciary or the everyday uh, mistreatment of asylum seekers uh, across the European Union or the violation of LGBTQI folks rights. Um, so within this context, uh, we wanted to ask uh, what does EU law and uh, governance have to do with these challenges or crisis, however you want to you wanna see it? Um, how does EU law contribute to shaping them? How does it reflect them? Um, how can it address their harmful, devastating impacts? And perhaps what are the limits of what the EU law uh, can do? And we brought together an amazing group of uh, speakers uh, who work at the intersection of law and political economy, uh, race, gender, and sexuality studies. And we're gonna uh, think through these issues uh, in relation to EU's management of migration flaw flows, uh, the questions of discrimination and social inequalities and EU economic governance. And we have also, as, as Christina mentioned, we have also organized a teaching workshop where we asked um, we asked scholars to uh, reflect on syllabus design, and hopefully this will help uh, teachers to think about their teaching methods, think about their syllabus, think about uh, articles they cases they assign. Uh, so we very much hope that these two days, day and a half, will be a, um, a great occasion for sharing uh, knowledge um, for learning from one another. And I want to, again, uh, thank you all for being here again in person or online. And, uh, and finally, um, I'd like to thank Laura Telsma, who's a PhD researcher here at ISO, for helping me with the smooth organization of the event today. And many, many thanks to Alicia van der Werf. Um, for her amazing support in the past couple of months, organizing an event like this is very hard under the present <laughs> um, circumstances. So thank you so much, Alicia, for, for everything. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, have a great event. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana, for that nice introduction. And, and indeed, thank you, Ivana and, and Lara and Alicia for the organization. Um, of the two-day conference, but also of this workshop and bringing together uh, these nice uh, speakers. What we will do in this workshop is having a conversation on migration policies in the EU uh, a bit broader. And we have four participants initially in the conversation, um, and I will introduce them to you. The first participant I would like to introduce, and I do so in alphabetical order, is uh, Iris Goldberg Lang. She is a Jean Monnet professor, and I see her nodding in the Zoom. <laughs> she is a Jean Monnet professor of European Union law at the University of Zagreb, 
Uh, she is coordinator of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence that is uh, with the name EU's Global Leadership in the Rule of Law. And she's holder of the UNESCO Chair on Free Movement of Persons, Migration and Intercultural Dialogue. Um, she held several visiting positions at Harvard Law School, University College of London, and others, which I will not name uh, all, because then, you know, I will be busy for another five minutes, I'm afraid. Um, she is editor-in-chief of the Croatian Yearbook of European Law, and recently she published uh, on migration and the rule of law in the European Constitutional Law Review, and in the publication, she takes a critical stance on the EU's new pact on migration and asylum. And I hope this does justice to you, uh, Iris. Um, secondly, I want to introduce Betty de Hart, who is sitting here. And if you make a noise, the camera will turn to you. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> It does not. Does it? No. No. no, no, no. Yeah. We have to later keep, on. Yeah. Later no, on. I'm not speaking <laughs> loud enough. <laughs> um, Betty de Hart is a professor of transnational families and migration law at the Vrije Universiteit here in Amsterdam, a former colleague of ours. She conducts legal, empirical, and historical research on national and European and international rules that transnational families encounter. Uh, what are the views behind these rules is a topic and the impact on especially the everyday life of transnational families. Uh, she received an ERC consolidated grant to establish a research team a research uh, project Euromix, which is on regulating mixed intimacies in Europe. Um, and then I would like to introduce uh, Charlotte O'Brien. Hello. <laughs> it's a bit slow in turning, I'm afraid. Charlotte is assistant professor in European Union law at the School of Law and Government at, uh, sorry, is a professor uh, at uh, York Law School. And um, she has degrees in law and uh, social and political sciences, and also lots of experiences in working for uh, citizens' advice offices. Um, she, special, she specializes in EU social law citizenship, both in the UK and, and uh, EU welfare law, UK law, welfare law. And uh, Charlotte brings together doctrinal and empirical studies. Um, and uh, in particular, she's developing new social legal research methods to study EU law. And she had recently an article in the Common Market Law Review called Between Devil and Deep Blue Sea. Um, and showing how EU citizens in the UK during the Brexit process sort of changed into collateral damage mm -hmm. of, that, of the Brexit. And then Janine Silga, also present in Zoom. Welcome, Janine. Um, she is assistant professor in European law at the School of Law and Government at uh, Dublin City University. She helped uh, before postdoctoral positions at the University of Luxembourg and the University of Venice, and she completed a PhD in law at the EUI. And her research focuses especially on the legal dimension of the migration development nexus in the EU policy framework. And Janine has also done substantial research on human rights in connection to both migration and asylum. Now, as you can see, we have speakers who focus, who all study migration, but from different aspects, focus on different topics, and we thought it would be very nice to bring them together and start a conversation on you know, what, what EU migration law is about. Um, and yeah, to kick it off, um, if we talk about policies of migration, migration management is a term that is often used, and uh, migration management is uh, very often presented as a win-win-win, win for the sending states, win for the receiving states, win for the migrants. Now, um, it can be questions whether that is the case. Um, before talking about the win-win-win, I, I uh, would like to suggest talking about this concept of migration management. You know, what does it bring with it? And is it, you know, is it a particular 
view on migration that has negative sides, positive sides. Um, so maybe it's good to start with that question. And if you, okay, if one of the speakers want to address, uh, um, um, right, if you connecting aspects or topics that also would be fine. Um, but first, I need to explain. Yeah? So we start the conversation with the participants uh, on the conversation, uh, the core participants. Then we open it up to the audience, first the audience in the room, and after that the audience in Zoom. And in Zoom, you can ask your questions by chat. And Lara, uh, a great she's a great assistant today, she will uh, monitor the chats and make sure that your questions uh, will be put to the floor and will, will be answered here also uh, or discussed. Let me put it that way. Answered is maybe too, too, too ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> so this term migration management, let's let's kick off with that. Um, Iris, can I ask you to say a few words about the term or the concept? Yeah, thank you. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Ivana and Christina and uh, uh, Annette for the invitation and for managing to organize this event in such difficult circumstances. It's an endeavor, really. So, what, what, uh, when you know, when Ivana suggested the topics or our discussion, and when I read this win-win-win. So lots of wins. I was like, okay, let's try to structure down the wins and the losses as well. And uh, already the the question in itself suggests that it's not really a win-win-win situation. And I tend to agree for a number of reasons. Um, so first of all, yes, there are. Um, so the migration and free movement. Also, if we talk about free movement within the con within the European Union of EU citizens. Um, from the less to so the more developed states does create a number of benefits for migrants and for the receiving states and for the EU as a whole. But it has a lot of social, economic and political downsides for the sending states. And I think these downsides should not be underestimated. Um, and there are possible solutions to that. And I'm not sure that currently, both within the context of the functioning of EU free movement and EU citizenship law, these challenges are properly addressed. And neither do I think that they are properly addressed in the context of migration of third country nationals. Now, as regards the functioning of EU free movement and EU citizenship law, I think that what would need to be done to address these issues and, and the losses, and not only the wins of, of, of uh, free movement for the sending uh, EU member states would be actually to reconceptualize the EU citizenship in a way that there are certain that EU citizenship also encompasses situations where certain threshold social rights are also granted for non-mobile, for static EU citizens. Consequently, there wouldn't be such a problem when, you know, and, and also the dark side of free movement, um, as I call it, and a lot of people call it, I think, where basically EU free movement law does cover and does protect those who are moving, whereas it's not covering those who are not moving. And I think that you know, the other side of the coin of reconceptualizing EU citizenship in this respect would be also to approach it also from the perspective of the EU budget. So I think that the EU budget would need to be, um, to, to be uh, secured or part of the EU budget would need to be secured to address such issues and regulate social rights of non-mobile EU citizens. Now, as regards migration of third country nationals into the EU, um, first of all, I think there is such a visible rift between 
EU citizens and third country nationals that, you know, we are, it's us against them, basically, that it's visible in every single aspect of EU law, for example. So the EU law takes a very sectoral approach towards third country nationals. We are letting in and regulating at the level of the EU law only those types or those categories of third country nationals whom we perceive to be desirable for us, like highly skilled migrants, seasonable workers, um, intra-corporate transferees and students. So people that everybody wants basically. Whereas if you are a low skilled migrant or just you know, a regular economic migrant who is not highly skilled, you depend on national law of each particular member state. Um, so there is no overarching shared set of EU-based rules. And economic migrants, apart from the desirable categories and maybe family members as well, can be perceived as outsiders in the EU society. And the last point that I would like to make uh, just briefly is that I do not think that this type of migration management, or in other words, that the development of new legal pathways can entirely resolve the problems associated to irregular migration. So I don't think it's possible for the very simple reason that we are letting in, at least at the level of EU law, only the desirable categories of third country nationals, whereas the majority of economic migrants cannot rely on EU law in this respect. So, so much from me uh, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, yes. I would just say, well, it's, it's, it's uh, the way the EU regulates, so the way we deal with management of, of uh, uh, migrants is, is not uh, the proper way is not bringing the correct solutions. Um, may I bring it a bit back to this concept of migration? Huh? In the EU treaty, we have, sorry, this concept of, of migration management. In the EU treaty, we have this, this provision that says that the EU should uh, work on the efficient management of migration flows. Huh? So using this term of uh, management. Now, what does it include? Does it bring with it looking at people in this very economic maybe way. Um, Charlotte, would you like to come in on that? Um, well, I, I would, but actually I'd like to sort of bounce it over to, uh, to Betty because I think you, uh, you had a really interesting critique in the notes that you circulated of the concept of migration management. Is it okay? If yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I was a bit cold, maybe, or a bit blunt in my uh, comments, so because I don't like the term, actually. I, I would never use it myself mm -hmm. in, in my academic work. I think it's a policy term, uh, to, and it sounds nice, as, and as we all know, working at universities, uh, management, managers can have these nice terms that sort of hide what's actually were, uh, happening on the ground floor. Uh, uh, last week at the we got this uh, email about uh, mindfulness and stuff that we could do and uh, public advice had to take a very angry mail about work uh, load uh, that we experience. So, and I think rightfully <laughs> so. Uh, and I think here you see the same happening. So yes, it's nice management terms, uh, win, win, win. And it has nothing to do with reality, I think. So I would never use it. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, work I'm looking at law. I'm a legal scholar. Uh, sometimes people think I'm a sociologist. Uh, but most sociologists think I'm very legal, so uh, I'm always a bit in between, and that's a good position, I think. Uh, but I look at law from the perspective of migrants uh, and of mixed, what I call mixed status families, so citizens who have a family relationship with a migrant, a non citizen. Uh, and from their perspective, uh, I think that there's not much to uh, of winning. Uh, I think it hides all in inequalities that are there in migration law in different ways uh, and also the history of migration law and how it developed and uh, the things that uh, Ivana mentioned uh, in her introduction of uh, the colonial past and how it, is, it has influenced uh, migration law that we have today, uh, the gender inequalities that are ingrained in the migration law that we have today. 
the racialization of certain groups that uh, are ingrained in the migration law that we have today. Uh, yeah, it hides all that. Uh, and that's, that's my problem with this idea of uh, migration management. I see you nodding. Yes, yeah. Um, and then I will get back to you, Janine, in a, in a moment. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I agree that I think the term management in, in the context of migration is, is misleading um, and inappropriate. That <clears throat> in some ways also, it's sort of the the thin end of the wedge. And I speak very much from the, the perspective of uh, someone who's lived through the referendum on EU membership in the UK and migration being such a prominent part of that, um, of that discourse. And uh, it, 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 it was sort of amalgamated. So there was the, um, the demonization of free movement rules under the EU, but they were uh, elided with the concept of migration as a whole uh, through this uh, slogan of taking back control, taking back control of the borders. And the, you know, the language of, migra uh, of migration management speaks to the language of controlling borders, really. And it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it leads in a dark direction. Um, the, I mean, for a start, the idea that there was uncontrolled movement in free movement terms was, was misleading and wrong because there were management, in inverted commas, um, um, measures exerted on free movement. It was just management through the labour market rather than management through borders. And it has its own dehumanising elements, whether you're <laughs> whichever way you're doing it, because it resulted in people who fell through the gaps of the, um, the approved economic migration par paradigm. So those who weren't sufficiently economically active, uh, who had gaps in their work records, um, all of which redounded detrimentally upon groups who are more likely to be socially excluded, uh, so and, and particularly vulnerable migrants, and people who had breaks in their work history, such as women, people who were in and out of work due to fluctuating conditions or disabilities, and then children just aren't included in the, in the scheme at all in their own right. They only exist as parasites as far as EU free movement law is concerned. Um, you know, they're there as family members, and so their rights are entirely, you know, EU citizenship notwithstanding, uh, are entirely dependent upon the migratory employment and relationship choices and misfortunes of their parents. Um, and so it's not uh, uh, tapping into my general argument that EU citizenship is a slightly illusory concept or phenomenon, um, that it really is. It's, a, it's an economic model, but economic does not mean ideologically um, or demographically neutral by any means. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's there's a male tilt to it, there's an able body tilt to it, there's an ageist tilt to it. Um, and in some ways, this formed part of the, I, I think, part of the problem in the defending EU membership that the pro-EU arguments in the UK were then vested very much in the economic, um, and they were in themselves dehumanizing arguments. They were treated uh, EU migrants as production factor labor, using the term coined by Anna Peter van der Meij. Um, and it turns out that you can't fight hate with sums, you know, who'd have thought. Um, <laughs> And, and it, it, there was a lot of hate at play, you know, in spite of what uh, some people might say, uh, that you had prominent le uh, leaders of the Leave campaigns, Nigel Farage, standing in front of a poster that was queues, uh, of queues of asylum seekers. You know, what has that got to do with uh, EU free movement? Nothing, but nevertheless implying as such, and declaring that the EU was all about free movement of jihadists and Kalashnikovs. Um, which is a regulation I've not come across. Um, and, and, and then all this fear mongering about Turkey joining. 
and you know it being sort of quite expressly racialized and xenophobic and discriminatory on the grounds of religion. Um, so there's a, a lot of hate at play that kind of bound up the EU free movement with migration at large. And it turns out a purely economic argument, which is a dehumanizing argument, is not really the best place to actually argue against all that stuff. Um, and so I, I guess it's, a, <laughs> uh, it's, it's essentially an, an appeal for a bit more love in the debate, I guess. <laughs> um, that, uh, uh, you know, as, as we've seen, you, you, know, you, you throw the beast red meat, they want more. Um, the, the ending of free movement has not sated the anti-migration um, elements in the UK. What we've ended up with is uh, a, just a, a sort of a, a pivoting of which migrants can we now focus our hatred upon. And so all of a sudden there's this uh, huge um, increase in salience of asylum seekers and people who are crossing the channel. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's become emergent that actually the numbers haven't actually increased that much in recent times. It's just that uh, the government finds it uh, politically convenient to focus upon them and now is advocating, the, you know, Home Secretary is advocating migrant pushbacks and talking about um, getting into arguments with the border force if border force employees refuse to force people to drown. Um, so, yeah. Migration management is the thin end of a nasty wedge. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for for uh, for that uh, contribution, interesting contribution. And and um, yeah, I think it's it's also what you're saying. It's also terminology. You know, efficient management. It is sort of economics already. Mm. And then when you when you address only the numbers, mm. it is a bit like uh, like uh, Max Frisch. Uh, once wrote, have we asked for workers, but we got humans instead, and then the, but we got humans instead is totally forgotten in this discourse. Yeah. 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 Um, Janine, we were, we were already talking a bit about, you know, the history of, of migration policy and, and uh, the racial elements and, and the colonial aspects of it. Um, you've been working on the migration development nexus, and I'm sure that you can tell us a bit more on, on this migration management ID uh, in that context. Thank you very much, Annette, and uh, thank you also very much uh, both to you and Ivana for invitation. Uh, while listening to you, I, I just wish I could be there with you because uh, <laughs> it's it's a wonderful conversation, and I'm, I'm uh, I would have loved to to meet uh, the new colleagues and to see you all uh, in person. But next time, <laughs> hopefully. So um, just I mean, as as you mentioned rightly, I'm uh, coming mostly from the the the, the migration and development uh, nexus approach. But just as a forward on the notion of migration management, because perhaps we are not uh, being entirely complete on this notion, and I just wanted to, to highlight that actually this notion from uh, from what we, we can understand of, of its history actually comes from um, an evolution from the, the zero immigration policy that, that came in the aftermath of the, of the oil crisis in the 70s, and it was developed by Bimal Ghosh, who actually saw that as a, as a progressive way to move beyond this zero immigration policy. So we perhaps have to, to do some, some kind of justice to, uh, to this notion. But apart from that, I totally and entirely agree with, uh, with all the critics that were expressed by, by the former speakers, and, uh, and I, I totally uh, echo them uh, as well. Um, perhaps one, um, I would not say an entirely positive side, but perhaps one side that has broadened which migration management has, has, has brought to the table is the fact that uh, rather than moving, whether, rather than, um, you know, an approach focused on, on purely state control that based on an individual state control of immigration now, I would say that we've moved, we are still in the framework of control. I totally agree with the former speaker and especially uh, Charlotte, you're, you're mentioning that. But I would say that now the control is rather has been pushed to the international level. So uh, there is now an international cooperation to achieve more control over immigration. So uh, from the government's point of view, um, 
per se would say that yes, perhaps there, there's a form of, I mean, this issue has been has been uh, pushed to the fore at the international level, so it could have could have shifted to the right side because broadening the perspective and also bringing in the perspective of sending countries, for instance, uh, could have shifted the debate towards a more liberal approach to migration management. But unfortunately, as uh, we've, we've highlighted, highlighted now so far, it has not been the case. So uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, I totally agree with all the, 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 the issues with, that were, that were um, that were brought to the table so far. And as you mentioned, um, this notion of migration management also um, it calls a certain vision of what we could understand by development. And in this sense, I, I want to echo what you were mentioning, Iris, about you know, the fact that within the EU legal framework, there is no protection for those who are not moving. And actually, I think that it is perfectly about this certain vision of economic development, which is common both to the EU and I would say to the rest of the world, probably. <laughs> so, so in this sense, I, I totally agree with that. So, and, and, and uh, on that more precisely, I want to say that the, the migration management paradigm as, as we know it currently, does not really bring a critique, actually does not at all bring any critique to um, the way in which the economic forces that are at play in the migration processes um, are actually uh, taking place. And in particular, they do not address the way in which the neoliberal globalization, which, uh, which we know now is both undermining development or the reach for um, the, the, the goal to achieve a more equal development and the way in which migration is taking place. And this clearly reflects in the binary between so-called highly desirable, highly skilled migrants versus those who would be lower skilled and non-desirable uh, for, for different reasons, including um, con in connection with, uh, with racial and uh, other types of, of stereotypes. So uh, in this sense, this approach in which, uh, in which uh, migration management has been conceived is completely uncritical um, in my view uh, and completely overlooks uh, migrants uh, as, as human and their rights as, um, as, a, as a consequence. And it actually, in my view, and when uh, coming from this per perspective, um, aims at maintaining the economist status quo. Uh, that's what I was trying to, to express rather than questioning the, the, the role of the current approach to, to development uh, as being mainly based on capitalist rather than human development as we know it now. And uh, to just um, give an example stemming from the EU um, context, um, I think that it's particularly um, clear when it comes to the migration of uh, people whom we might, uh, or the movement of um, EU citizens whom we might label as being uh, poor or poor Europeans, uh, whose presence obviously in the member states are not considered, is not considered economically uh, beneficial. So while they may be protected, um, so they are not within the same conceptual framework as third country national, this is clear, so they are protected, for instance, against violent forms of expulsion, they're still are facing considerable social exclusion. So I think that the common denominator between what we may call the, the free movement of persons within the EU and uh, the broader um, context of migration at the international level, or migration management as we know it uh, today, um, probably boils down to the, 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 the notion that we have of, of economic development, uh, which is completely not uh, critical in the, in the current context of, of migration management. So I, I don't want to, uh, to speak for too long, but uh, thank you so much for giving the floor. And I hope that uh, I will be able to come back to the discussion <laughs> later on. Thank you. Great, Will, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, listening to you, um, so the win-win-win, um, um, both uh, Iris and Nadine, but also Charlotte, you have been talking about, on the one hand, the receiving society uh, that is supposed to win, but at the same time can be very hostile towards uh, a migrant, um, but also the sending states. Uh, uh, Janine and Iris, you also talked a bit about that, and I know uh, your article, The Dark Side of Free Movement, is addressing that. So the, the win for the sending states is not always clear. 
and um, uh, we'll talk about the position of the migrant a bit later. Um, maybe, Iris, can I give you the floor to sort of react to uh, what Janine said and then maybe also addressing a bit the, the win or the absence of win for the sending state? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that the most visible loss is basically for the sending states, no matter whether we are looking uh, geographically only um, at free movement within the European Union. And I can tell you from my own experience, I, I live in Croatia, I come from Croatia, which is one of the less developed EU member states that joined the EU the last in, in 2013. Um, and if you if you travel around Croatia and go to some of its eastern regions um, towards Serbia and Bosnia and so on, you will see yeah. that certain parts of Croatia are really kind of empty because people have left. So we really you can see it on on a daily basis that there is a visible brain drain and youth train. And I can speak from my own experience, uh, a number of my best students, so we are talking about highly skilled, have used the opportunity when Croatia joined in 2013 to actually move um, to different EU member states. And I think that's great. I think that's amazing for them. And I always encourage them to do that. Um, but on the other side, the dark side of such movement is the the loss and not only the economic but the social loss that is felt by the sending states be it croatia romania bulgaria or or whichever and this is why you know i'm i'm addressing this from the perspective of what could be done by eu law uh, by the european union in general to address this and there are possibilities but I think, and I think that, you know, cohesion funds are not enough. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot, but they're not enough. I think that really um, reconceptualization uh, of EU citizenship and further EU integration would be needed to address these, these challenges for the sending member states. And if we look a little bit broader at the global perspective, of course, then, the, the negative effects of migration for the sending states are even more visible because there we are talking about states that are even less developed. So, you know, um, what's been proposed by, by the Commission's proposal of the whole reform of the European migration asylum system, the migration asylum pact of these partnerships with third countries, First of all, the way that they are drafted, the, the, the way this proposal is made is so vague that I'm not sure that really anybody can really pinpoint what the European Commission meant by that. But on the other hand, I do not think that these partnerships can in any way really address the problems, um, which are, you know, the problems for the sending, for the sending states, and also the issue that we have addressed previously with regard to irregular to irregular migration that will neither that will neither solve the problems of irregular migration nor actually do uh, much good for for the sending states. Yeah, well, thank you. And and, and um, what you're telling now reminds me of, of something of the blunt statement Betty uh, uh, wrote. And when, we, when we sort of pre-discussed what questions uh, uh, or what, what, what topics we would address, um, and that you said, well, if, if it is migration manage management, what is happening now, then we should fire the manager. <laughs> on spot, yes. <laughs> on spot. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, yeah, it is, you know, there, there are, uh, the win-win-win does not seem to be uh, so much of a win. Huh? And maybe also not for the receiving states. And now I look at Charlotte, but maybe also at, at uh, Betty. Uh, so, do you have any remarks to make here? Can, can I can I ask you Iris a question? Sure, sure. Yeah, by all means. Hi, Iris. Uh, really uh, interested in everything that you were saying. Uh, I'm particularly interested in um, the suggestion that a reconceptualization of EU citizenship is needed to help address the brain and youth drain. What, 
I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question. What, what kind of reconceptualization? How, how do you think it would help? Uh, yeah, so, you know, to, to simplify things, I think that, you know, setting, so, so what, what EU law does, it does set certain thresholds in terms of uh, social rights of mobile EU citizens. So if you are crossing the borders in between two EU member states, you trigger the application of EU law and there are certain rules with regard to your social rights and other rights, of course. But if you don't do that, if you are a static EU citizen, then basically what you have to rely on um, is national law. And national law might set very different thresholds in terms of social rights of, of people who live there, meaning that social rights in certain member states are much uh, less protected than social rights in other member states. Now, if the EU set certain thresholds, uh, which would then have to be respected by all EU member states across the EU, that would have an effect to at least, you know, provide that a certain basic level of, of rights are granted to anybody, to domestic nationals who have never moved anywhere. Uh, so for whom there is absolutely no link to cross-border movement. Would that be possible by itself? I don't think so because of course that would cost a lot of money. So the question is whether we could use the EU budget more wisely uh, to address issues like that. And also, you know, to think in economic terms, which <laughs> I must admit is difficult for me, I'm not an economist and, you know, but it does help, you know, so we are, we are thinking of, of, you know, cohesion funds and things like that to help the less developed regions across the EU. And that's all great. But, you know, I suppose that all EU member states invest a lot of money in each one of us during our education. So I, don't, I, I know that, you know, uh, for example, for my students, a lot of money was basically addressed, uh, was, was invested in them, in me and everybody else. Now, if that person leaves when he or she is, I don't know, 25, then the, the, the knowledge and all the, the human capital is actually used somewhere else. Now, would that need to be addressed by the EU to actually say in economic terms, okay, this is the value of human capital who has actually left member state A, where a lot of money was invested in that person and is actually using that knowledge in member state B. How do we calculate that? And I'm not saying that this is enough. Of course, money is far from sufficient. So there would need to be political change and real trust in, in domestic institutions and, and so on, in the judiciary and so on. So, you know, this is just part of a much bigger picture. I don't know whether I've addressed your, your question properly. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was a, a really clear case for um, greater rights for static EU citizens. That so EU, EU citizenship should be less of an adjunct to economic free movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to step in here, or um, yeah? Well, many interesting things have been said. Um, <coughs> Um, on the relationship with the, the, the um, sending states, I, I again would like to refer to the history of colonialism. Uh, yeah. As authors as Atsuma have put forward, has he pleaded for uh, making labor migration possible as a rule, regardless of uh, highly skilled or not, uh, uh, as a sort of a yeah, paying a debt uh, uh, for uh, what uh, European states did in the times of colonialism? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, uh, first uh, uh, we went there and then uh, did all kinds of things uh, that uh, um, benefited us as, uh, as European states. And uh, then uh, the states became independent and we turned people into non citizens and then said, well, and now we are going to manage migration. And that's also the, so that's, um, yeah, one point on your question about that migration does not benefit the receiving states. I, 
yeah, uh, would not want to go there because of all the reasons that we put forward uh, yeah. on the UK context. Uh, but I want, would like to point out that often that this picture is painted that uh, the normal citizens uh, were not involved in uh, in migration, uh, don't want migration, that had this political discourse. Uh, and so uh, there is a picture painted of migrate, migrants on one hand and citizens who do not want migration on the other hand. And uh, part of my uh, work is also to yeah, destabilize this categorization and to point at the fact that, for instance, uh, family, the sponsors of family migrants are most often citizens uh, and also often <coughs> born citizens and native born citizens. Uh, uh, so this yeah, also uh, makes clear that family migration that is often seen as something that comes automatically after labor migration and after uh, uh, asylum uh, is, is something of an independent force. Uh, I think that's important to point out. On Iris' point of reconceptualizing EU citizenship uh, to benefit static citizens, uh, if I understood correctly, I think it's also another way to do it, and uh, several member states have done this in the past, and I don't think that caused many problems. It's just that treat them as EU citizens and give them the rights that EU citizens have in the new citizen directive. So what's the problem of that? Belgium did it, Austria did it. At some point they decided to leave that policy because they saw all kinds of problems connected to that in terms of yeah, the threat of too much migration, etc. But I think that's a very... Uh, uh, Easy solution that could, uh, and that has been tried also by the European Commission. Yeah, but the negotiations started to get what the European Commission wanted, the member states didn't want it. But it's a very easy way to solve this issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then uh, you're correct, especially in, in the field of family migration. Yeah? And yes, yes, it is also the Netherlands. migration because right? the national law is far stricter, used to be stricter than the family unification directive. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, maybe so we talk about a bit about the wingman for the state, but maybe uh, also address the migrants. And Janine, um, may I ask you if you want to respond to what has been said before, you're very welcome. Um, but also, if you could talk a bit about how you view the win or the not win for the migrant and the position of the migrant in, in a host society. Thank you very much, Annette. I, I was listening to all of you with uh, with much interest. Actually, when I when I thought about this win win win, um, I could find some win for the receiving state, obviously in terms of migration management, because they managed to to maintain this control oriented um, dimension of migration, which we know. Some wins as well for the sending states, because actually I think that I mean you are you are mentioning uh, Croatia, Iris, uh, so I, I'm not so familiar with uh, with uh, with this uh, the situation in this state, but there are some very powerful sending countries such as Morocco, for instance, who really which really have you know some uh, some negotiating powers to some extent also uh, Mexico. Obviously, they are not in the in a similar position uh, to uh, receiving states. I, I totally agree with that, but I would not say sending states has been completely deprived or of any capacity to negotiate at the international level. But where I really see the biggest loss for me <laughs> is for migrants, because migrants do not have, there is no, um, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm actually uh, talk, uh, thinking about the global compact on migration. There is nowhere um, any institutionalized framework for migrants to express their interests at the international level. So they really seem, we, we talk about this win, 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 but there is no, um, it does not reflect from the institutional point of view, not at all. And when it comes to their human rights, of course, they are mentioned in theory. I mean, we know about this discrimination, but nowhere is this question that there is um, that the legal status of migrants is, is actually a, a real issue because, um, I mean, yes, the compact mentions that regardless of the status of migrants, they should all be entitled to fundamental rights. But what about the effectiveness of that? We, we can all see how this is complex. And I think that even, I mean, we were talking about this, um, this lack of um, perhaps of, of 
um, social and intellectual capital that that leaves a sounding country to I mean <laughs> social capital and there I, I really wanted to to echo I think I don't know if it was um, Charlotte or Betty when you were you were mentioning you know I think it was Charlotte you mentioned you know children are as parasites and I think that in this word that you that you use it, it really it rang a bell because actually I think that um, migration management and the way in which migration is controlled is really the site of, of symbolic violence when it comes to human for me the, this is the, the, the way in which I, I can I can express it best best because you know we, we we are only we are fragmented bodies we are fragmented their brains and their arms and their feet and you know we see them as as um, flows or stuck you know it's it's quite strong it's it's um, and this is when when you mention you know this this word this the word of parasite you know it's really it's an animal metaphor almost that you used Charlotte and I think that it is very true and also we fragment the collective uh, migrant body when we just we are mentioning you know those different legal status in which migrants are supposed to 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 really be uh, you know to really to be rigid within this this status and to comply with the the, the, the demands of, of their status and if you are an irregular migrant you have to leave and if you are a highly skilled migrant you have to perform you have to to give back and you know to the sending country and to give as much as you can to your receiving country so so for me when when I I mean the the the, the heart of my critique to this win-win-win axis would really go to the fact that the greatest losers for me are migrants because they are not visible at the institutional level, mostly for, for this reason. <laughs> Thank you for, for listening. Um, yes, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if I could, um, I, do, I really agree with everything uh, Janina was uh, was just saying, um, particularly about the the, the dehumanizing and the uh, sort of almost uh, re uh, materializing of, of of migrants as um, as, as, as body parts. Um, I just wanted to come back on the point about uh, that that uh, that you were mentioning, Annette, about the hostility of receiving societies and you know where where they fit on the on the win lose spectrum. And just to just to say that I think when we're talking about this kind of hostility, we need to recognise the responsibility that the uh, that national governments bear here that the assumption that individuals or members of the public or electorates are inherently atavistic and parsimonious is, I think, misplaced. That what happens is there's a lot of uh, politically convenient othering done by political leaders to stir this up. And, uh, and, and the UK is like a prime example of this, that what we saw in, you know, prior to the referendum from, um, well, I, I, I guess for decades, but in particularly, uh, particularly from 2013 onwards, was um, the, uh, the coalition government uh, coming up with uh, new rules, uh, particularly targeting EU nationals um, and coming out with um, headlines um, I mean, it was it was sort of govern, governance by press release headlines about rogue benefit claimants and stamping down on it and accelerating measures to uh, stop uh, migrants um, from um, exploiting or EU migrants from from exploiting the EU rules. And there was quite frankly no evidence that there was a problem. Um, and the government itself or uh, orchestrated a balance of competences review that was a massive wide-reaching consultation with all sorts of stakeholders um, including you know very authoritative stakeholders like the Scottish government and, um, and other bodies responded about where the balance of competences should lie on all sorts of different components of EU law and on free movement law the evidence was overwhelming that it's basically fine and we're happy and it's a good um, and yet they uh, it, that did not serve the government rhetoric and so they kind of buried this review ignored it then produced a um a, a report that cited a couple of uh loud mouthed commentators 
uh, declaring and declaiming what the British people wanted, regardless of the fact they bore no relationship to what the British people wanted, um, and it served the government's purpose. So there was this process of what um, what I've been describing as kind of almost discrimination by declaration by the state. It was it was explicitly try, um, saying things that were discriminatory against EU nationals. Um, in a way that was, you know, it, it was ill-founded and it was disingenuous. And there was also this huge cognitive dissonance going on because it wasn't as though the government was, uh, or the EU, the UK state was at the same time um, railing against all sorts of forms of EU movement, free movement at EU level, you know, in EU circles, it was saying one thing and then it was saying, coming back and saying one, a different thing to the electorate. Um, and then we had, uh, David Cameron's attempt to uh, renegotiate membership of the EU to address all these um, mythical problems, and you know he com comes back with this uh, with this new settlement deal. And surprise, surprise, it turns out you know when he went there, and you know some of the uh, the advisors who were there helping with the with the negotiation have since you know, issued their reports. Daniel Korski's written about it, saying the problem was. We didn't have any evidence that there was a problem. You know, that's that's why there wasn't much to negotiate. There wasn't a, a great deal of new settlement that came out of it. Um, uh, and yet, they, you know, I mean, what they came out of it with was you know this promise of a potential benefit break and the EU Commission saying, um, oh yeah, we think under the circumstances the UK would be entitled to it. And all of that was massively disingenuous as well. And I think that was a you know, that's a moment of shame for the EU Commission at that point yeah. in time, because they were bending to what was essentially conservative rhetoric that you know, supported the, uh, the, the ideology of, the, of a particular political party, not social reality. Um, and then you have this huge amount of, I don't know, surprise being feigned when just a few months before the referendum, the government suddenly decides, oh yeah, we've got this new settlement. Electorate, you should vote to stay in the EU. Having dripped this poison into the ears of the electorate through the media, explicitly through the media, um, for, for, for years, and having said up until like February 2016, oh, there's a real problem with EU membership, we really need to renegotiate it, and there's this issue with free movement, and all these benefit tourists, um, you know, the idea that they couldn't suddenly, um, you know, do a U-turn in that tanker of hatred. I mean, you know, in retrospect, it seemed kind of unsurprising that that wasn't, you know, that, that they didn't manage to uh, to win the referendum on that basis. Um, so it's it, it just a, a really long-winded way of saying, I think, you know, we need to remember the, re the responsibility that political leaders bear here, that we can't really expect social solidarity to happen between peoples if there are massive um, impulses against social solidarity at um, leadership level. Yeah. yeah. So indeed, huh? so it's, it's a rhetoric, the language, and, mm. and uh, but I think probably also the acts of, of the authorities mm. um, that yeah, you know, address migrants in a certain way yeah. and turn them maybe in a specific group also. Mm. Huh? And I see Betty nodding. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with what you said. I think uh, indeed that is, it's not that the population uh, of Lucifer country by nature or so to speak is yeah. against migration. I don't believe it at all. And mm. again, it ignores all the people of all of the, the part of the population who have a foreign family member mm. and who want that family member admitted. Uh, so uh, then yeah. they are sort of uh, stricken out of that picture. Uh, uh, and you see it also happening at the EU level, I think. Uh, and uh, an example of uh, yeah, the topic that I've been working on is made of convenience. Mm -hmm. um, the member states in some negotiations with the uh, European Commission sort of forced the European Commission to take action there and to develop this handbook on measures of convenience. Uh, in spite of the, there being no evidence at all that this was a huge problem. Uh, they stated, well, this is a huge problem, really, really. And the European Commission asked, so where are the statistics? Well, nobody had any statistics, so there was no proof at all. Still, they forced the European Commission to take action. So this, this handbook uh, of measures of convenience uh, was developed 
that, that uh, emphasized uh, human rights limitations to uh, control practices, but nevertheless uh, resulted in an in, uh, increased uh, practice of control in many member states, including the Netherlands, uh, with yeah. day long interviews of couples about uh, uh, how they can prove their love and stating that you are in love is obviously not enough. Right? You have to submit your WhatsApp conversations, your uh, whatever digital things you have, photographs, etc., etc. Uh, know every detail of not only your partner but also his or her family, etc., in order to prove your love. Um, um, yeah, there you see the same thing, uh, uh, and often also connected, especially to union citizens with a third country uh, national of specific combinations, also very gendered, and of course it's always the, uh, almost always the female sponsors who are uh, suspected of being duped into a marriage of convenience uh, by a male migrant uh, who only has a residence permit in mind. Uh, uh, so indeed, I think it's very important to uh, to understand that and how that influences migration yeah. policies and yeah. enforcement of, of these policies. Yeah. Maybe before and I'm looking at Lara, if there are many questions already in the in the chat. So if you have questions, please uh, and keep them on. Please ask them in the chat. Uh, before I open the floor, I would like to address one one. Uh, uh, yeah, one topic that is that is linked to this, and this is what, and because I'm interested in in, in how you see this, um, when I saw the the Commission plan on on integration and uh, inclusion, it is addressed to migrants and uh, uh, EU citizens with a migratory background, and it seems as if you know, uh, if your parents are migrants, you 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 will always be in that category. Um, and my question is, is it a good idea to address groups like these or should we, as, as Iris said in the beginning, maybe reconceptualize citizenship and start addressing people as citizens or just as people instead of these categories, migrants, non-migrants. Iris, um, may I come back to you? Yeah, thank you. So it would be ideal to address people uh, based on their residency, basically, you know, if they're residents, you know, they have certain rights, including political rights. Um, and, you know, when we, we have addressed a number of issues and challenges related to migrants, not only refugees, but also economic migrants and so on. And the fact is that, you know, my, my impression is that people always or, or often tend to associate uh, especially refugees only you know and and the, our our duties let's call it that towards re refugees only at the very basic and simple level you know we have to make sure that their basic needs in terms of food uh, health and housing are satisfied but that's also only the first level the second level which is equally important which of course can be fulfilled only if they do have enough food and housing and so on, is their complete political and social participation. And integration or inclusion or however you call it, needs to satisfy both of these layers, I think. Um, and partly due to the way EU law works, due to the fact that you know it takes a very as i said a very structural approach towards economic migration and leaves um, entry um, you know the question whether a person will be allowed to enter in the eu if he or she is not an asylum seeker to to member states and to their national laws due to that and also due to the fact that integration is something that is not all uh, EU competence. So the European Union has only complementary uh, competence with regard to integration. Um, most of these things depend not so much on, on states, but I would go even beyond that uh, on local levels. So on regions and on cities, because most of these migrants and refugees live in cities. So it's very important how these urban areas respond to 
the challenges of, of you know, integration or inclusion of migrants. And I do agree with, with your question and also what was suggested by Ivana is that, you know, there is this kind of a, an understanding that, you know, if you expect a person to integrate, you are basically expecting that person to fulfill certain duties, whereas you stand there completely immobile, you are fine as, as the host member state national. Um, and this should not be the case, you know, there should be some kind of a going forward in both directions, uh, which sometimes is very difficult. But I have to say that when it comes to the European Commission and the topic of integration, they only have soft law powers. So, you know, the action plan and a number of other documents that the Commission has issued, they have soft law powers due to the fact uh, that the European Union has very limited competences in this area. And the final point that I would like to make is that due to this, um, this complex situation with regard to, you know, the way integration and, and economic migration uh, works within the framework of EU law, very much depends not only on member states, on regions and on cities, but also on migrants themselves. Meaning that, you know, if things do not work well, and they often don't, they are kind of left to themselves to self-organize. And then due to the fact that they do not have or have a very, very limited political powers, the self-organization that is happening on the side of migrants and refugees is usually taking the informal and not the formal character. So we can see a lot of examples of, of, uh, of informal self-organization of third country nationals um, in order to, you know, kind of try to, to adjust to the system. And the whole idea is that this self-organization can be seen as a kind of a mechanism of supplementing or of substituting EU level or national level protection of their, on the one hand, basic needs, and on the other hand, social and political rights, when these needs and these political and social rights are not protected sufficiently by the EU and by the host member states. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so treat people based on residence and, and make sure that there is inclusion and that works both ways. Huh? So not only duties on the margins. Um, yes, Betty, Charlotte, um, yeah. add oh, something you and or Janine, maybe? <laughs> Because all of us, all of us, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he maybe may, uh, yeah. if I can uh, yeah. react to one point uh, yeah. of what was being said is that the EU has no competence on integration, but uh, the thinking of integration is, of course, included, incorporated in migration law and translated into obligations to integrate. Uh, uh, so in the Family Unification Directive, uh, you see the uh, pre entry test that is allowed. Um, um, in, in, um, so integration policies in several member states have been translated into legal applications and people who do not meet that requirement can either not uh, have family migration or uh, cannot uh, obtain a permanent residence permit uh, or can be excluded from certain benefits or uh, can be excluded from citizenship. So I would say that uh, there's much more going on than just uh, 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 that, that is translated into legal obligations that have an exclusive uh, or yeah. exclusionary uh, effect, I think, uh, for migrants. And uh, in, if you look at the statistics, you can again see how it affects different groups of migrants differently. That's for some people, it's a piece of case to take such an exam and they are maybe annoyed that they have to take the effort to do that and pay the fees and for others it's a real hindrance uh, and of course we already know i don't have to explain who those groups are who those different groups are 
Uh, so I, I'm very concerned also about this category of my, uh, people with migration background, where it came from. I think the Germans were the first ones to use this. Yeah, maybe the French, maybe, but then Janine can tell us maybe a bit more about that. And yeah, uh, since 2016, it's in the Netherlands, the phrase, yeah. and it also includes those people who have only one parent who was born abroad. And it sort of leads to a yeah, integration, intergenerational status that is passed on, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, there were even efforts sometimes in the Netherlands to also count not only second but also third generation. So then you have only, I think, one grandparent who was born abroad or something. So yeah. And although maybe the intentions may be good, I think practice shows that not much that comes out of it is, is so good. So I yeah, I, I was worried. I did not know the text I have looked at it today in the train. Uh, and then we study it further because uh, yeah. I think it's important, but uh, yeah, I'm not so pleased with it. The name you want to go in that and then and then you open up, yeah. Janine? Do you want me to go first or um, I don't wish you there was someone else? I just uh... could you could you briefly respond? So yeah. actually, I'm not sure if I heard um, all that uh, that he has said. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, but I mean, I know that we are in the field of integration and that you are saying that there are more duties and that uh, they are also somehow discriminatory. Um, so when it comes to mentioning um, EU citizens with a migrant background, and when I, I actually read uh, the document uh, which you, you mentioned in the questions, um, what struck me is that probably I mean, you, probably, Betty, you're right, the intent is good, <laughs> but I think that more than that, it is an acknowledgement that, which is the first step, hopefully, it is an acknowledgement that something has gone wrong with the immigration history of, of the EU member states, or at least with the, the, the immigration history of some member states. But the problem is that in the way in which this is uh, framed in the, the commission document, it does not tell the whole story. And it says, if you know, it did not want to do so. And the result, the end result is that actually it makes, and I think that it echoes what you what you were mentioning, Betty, it, it makes migration being the same as reflecting a kind of stigma on which further discrimination can actually uh, be applied. So, and, and it's also transgenerational as you as you are mentioning. So I think that the, the way in which this is framed is actually not uh, not the best. And in this sense, I also wanted to, to, to mention, you know, the, the way in which the commission approaches the issue of radicalization without really uh, going deeper. And I think that if we are to talk about the integration issues, if we want to, 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 to label it in this way of um, migrants, obviously, but also of EU citizens with a migrant background, what does this mean? We would have to unearth the history. We have to unearth also to you know to think deeper about the the way in which migration is actually not probably the primary issue, but uh, perhaps a symptom of something wider also going on at the economic level. You know, this there is a distributional issue at the heart of migration processes. So and also the lack of solidarity at the international uh, level. So and, and I think that when we talk about um, integration, it, it has to go deeper because the lives of people obviously are deeper. And, and um, I really, I mean, just on this, uh, this point on radicalization, I think that it is extremely scary because it was, I think, um, probably the, the most scary, um, you know, um, um, I don't know, phenomenon that happened in the recent history of Western Europe on the, 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 the realization that there was a part of the society that could actually turn against their own country. But, um, in the way in which this is framed um, and it is not reflected upon, I would say, this makes it look as a, as a disease. And that's what I was mentioning in my question, a strange disease that only EU citizens with a migrant background could catch, which is not, which is not at all the case, which is not at all the case. There, are, there is a deeper history to, to really um, unhearth here. And um, so there is an acknowledgement, which is good, but it has to go further so that we can really um, take the best, make the best of, of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Charles, quickly, and then I open it up to uh, Christina if has a question. Yeah. Oh, uh, can, can you be? Can, can I just briefly respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> briefly, and then Christina, and Thank then, you. you know, uh, if anyone, yeah, I have a question. 
so yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be super quick, which is just to say that um, yeah, I, I agree with the with the foregoing, but um, I guess I guess sort of a bit like the the, the lawyer inside me that uh, wants to go for definitions. I'd like to uh, raise a plea against the political debasement of the word integration. That the word integration means the coming together of different parts to form a whole, a new whole. It does not mean, as it is being used, assimilation. And yet it's all being posed as some sort of one way assimilation process where migrants as this body bear this responsibility. Whereas actually, uh, and this is going back to your, your point in as to whether we should be referring to migrants and EU nationals with a migrant background or just citizens. And I think we should be referring to citizens because we should be recognizing that we all bear a responsibility of integration of a not, and not just adapting these individuals, but adapting ourselves and recognizing that migration shapes society and never mind individuals society has a migrant background mm -hmm. yeah. so okay thank you thank you for that um christina though i said we open up to the floor but uh, you know i'm a lousy chair because <laughs> 10 minutes past time so let's have the discussion um for everybody christina you